بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم تسليم على سيدنا محمد الصادق الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين رب شحر صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله we are together again studying the text Matharatul Qulub the purification of hearts of Imam Muhammad Mawlud Al-Yaqubi Rahmatullahi Alayhi Today inshaAllah we're going to look at two or three diseases of the heart The first disease we're going to look at is called Ghil in Arabic and Ghil translates as rancor and it comes from the same Arabic word from which the word aghlal originates. This word aghlal is mentioned in the Holy Quran and it means yokes. The yoke that you would put across an animal's neck or back. The yoke that weighs someone down. The aghlal are those things that weigh people down. And the word ghil and aghlal come from this root meaning because it is something that weighs down in the heart and causes a person to commit treachery and have malice towards other people. Imam Muhammad Mawlud begins this section by saying, وَالْغِلُّ مَا يَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي تِبْيَانًا أَنْ يُرْبَطَ الْقَلْبَ عَلَى خِيَانًا أَوْ غَدْرٍ أَوْ خَدِيعَةٍ وَشُدْ لِذَلِكَ الْرِبَاطُ هُوَ الْحِقْطِ Rancor, O you who seeks its elucidation, who seeks for it to be made clear, is when the heart is bound, again that binding notion, is when the heart is bound to treachery, betrayal, or some trickery. The knot binding it to the heart is resentful malice, this hiqd. And this is defined as being so angry with someone that a person wishes harm to befall them. When they're so upset and so angry with someone that they're willing to betray them, to act treacherously toward them, and to go out of their way to get back at them. This rancor is a form of anger that causes a person to have resentment and to have malice and hatred and seek ways of getting revenge. This is ghil according to the definition given by the ulama. Now, it's possible for people in this life among believers to have malice and to have rancor and to have bad feelings among, among themselves, bad blood as we call it. And we have to take active steps to remove that. We take active steps to number one, prevent that from occurring. And number two, if it occurs, we have to take active steps to remove it in this life. With the recognition that when people enter Jannah, one of the blessings they receive in Jannah is that the ghil they may have felt in this life will be removed from them. وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مِنْ غِلْ That Allah Ta'ala will remove the, the malice, will remove the rancor that existed between people in this life. Imam Muhammad Mawlud says here in the text that the knot binding this to the heart is hiqd. Hiqd is this resentful malice. What is the treatment for this? He says the treatment, he says, أَحْسِنِ إِلَيْهِ طُقْنَةِ الْأَعْدَى ذْكُرِي مَغْفِرَةً وَارِدَةً فِي الْخَابَرِ فِي سَائِرِ الْجَمْعِ مَرَّتَيْنِ فِي يَوْمَيْ أَنْخَمِيسِ وَالْإِثْنَيْنِ He says, show kindness to the object of your rancor, and you will cause your enemies to despair. Keep also in mind the forgiveness, as mentioned in the sound tradition, promised twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays. If we feel rancor towards people, then the medicine to get rid of that feeling, which becomes a disease in the heart, is to show goodwill. This is incredibly difficult. It's so easy to tell people, oh, forgive this person, forgive that person. And we often are trained and socialized 
to give superficial forgiveness, to, to say to someone, I forgive you, when we don't really mean to forgive them. This becomes socialized in us from uh, a young age as children, especially among siblings when they fight. If the parent tells the aggressing child to say sorry, they don't really mean that they're sorry. And the one who's told to forgive isn't really forgiving, but they're pressured to. So we get used to this superficial forgiveness, but real forgiveness is work. So the remedy is to show the person goodwill if you have rancor towards them. And if you have ghil in your heart, you want to take the proactive steps to resolve it here and now, either by addressing the issues directly, head on, or by forgiving the person, or by showing goodwill to the person, because people are generally predisposed to those who show kindness to them. Imam Muhammad Mawlud here says that if you show kindness to the object of your rancor, then you will cause your enemies to despair. Who are these enemies? Well, the only real enemy we have in the big picture is shaitan. And by forgiving people, genuinely forgiving them, that enrages shaitan and causes him to despair because the opposite is true. He rejoices when we fight. He gets very happy and rejoices when people are at each other's throats, metaphorically or, or literally. So by showing kindness to the object of rancor, by forgiving, by relenting, by taking proactive steps to address these issues and excise them from the heart, it causes shaitan to despair and is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He mentions another remedy here. He says it is to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. And this is very subtle because there's the hadith which mentions that on Mondays and Thursdays, these are special days of tajalliyat, of divine disclosures, when the actions of human beings are uh, uh, conveyed via the angels uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is already well aware of the actions of human beings. But it mentions in the, in the sound hadith that on the day of Monday and Thursday, Allah Ta'ala also forgives people with a special forgiveness. And it mentions in the hadith that the angels will, will say to Allah Ta'ala that there are two believers fighting one another. On the day of increased forgiveness, the angels convey, they say to Allah Ta'ala, but there are two believers fighting each other. And Allah Ta'ala says to those angels, leave them be until they set things right between themselves. The implication here is that Allah Ta'ala will not forgive a person if they have rancor towards someone else. And that only by dealing with that rancor and removing it will a person obtain the forgiveness of Allah Ta'ala. So this is one of the incentives, one of the treatments for rancor is to seek forgiveness and to fast on Mondays and Thursdays in the appropriate way, which is to fast them having dealt with the rancor that may exist between us and other people. This is really important and we need to spend more time learning about what it means to seek forgiveness beyond saying, I forgive you while still holding rancor in the heart. Just as we need to learn how to seek forgiveness of others and not simply say, I'm sorry, please forgive me and then get upset with them if they don't forgive right away. So this is really a seeking of forgiveness tinged with an expectation and an anger if the person doesn't immediately forgive. It works both ways and it's a lot of work. This is the first disease we're going to cover today. The second and the third are actually, they're intertwined such that we could look at them as one disease or we could look at them as two separate diseases where one gives rise to the other. And these are the diseases of boasting and the disease of arrogance. The word for boasting is fakhr and the word for arrogance is kibr and these two go hand in hand. Imam Muhammad Mawlud says, وَالْفَخْرُ مِنْ جُمْلَةِ ذِي الْخِلَالِ وَهُوَ تَمَدُّحْكَ بِالْخِصَالِ Boasting is counted among these peculiarities, among these qualities, these diseases of the heart. It is defined as you're praising yourself for your good qualities. So boasting is considered a disease of the heart as well. And it is defined as bragging about 
our good qualities to others. And we've mentioned this before, that if the person is mentioning their good qualities to others or their good deeds as a way of encouragement and expressing gratitude and showing thankfulness for Allah's blessings upon them, that is not considered boasting. Boasting is sinful when it is done to brag, to big up one's ego. If it's done to thank Allah Ta'ala and to express gratitude, that is not sinful. So we as a, as a general rule should be avoiding any form of boast. We should avoid boasting, we should avoid making claims about ourselves, and this is the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the humblest of Allah's creation. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in the famous hadith related by uh, Imam Muslim, Ana Sayyidu Waladi Adam Wala Fakhr. I am the master, the chief of the children of Adam, and that is no boast. There are two things here. Number one, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam is conveying to us the reality that he is the Sayyid, the master, the chief, the leader of all of the children of Adam. And he adds, and that is no boast. Teaching us that if we do mention a good quality we have for a, a good reason, it's important to uh, add that disclaimer that it's not by way of boasting. Imam al Nawawi has a very interesting comment about this hadith. In his commentary on Sahih Muslim, Imam al Nawawi says that the Prophet was commanded by Allah Ta'ala to tell the Ummah that he is the chief and master of all of the children of Adam. And were it not for the divine command instructing him to say this, he wouldn't have said it. Because of his immense humility, he wouldn't have said it. But Allah Ta'ala told him to tell us so that we know his rank, to tell us that he is the chief, the Sayyid of the children of Adam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even then he adds, وَلَا فَخْرٍ And this is the humblest of Allah's creation and who is also the best of Allah's creation Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So if someone, uh, also if someone is mentioning their good qualities in order to direct someone to them because of their expertise and mastery of a, of a subject, that is not boasting. So if you are an expert in a certain field and someone is looking for an expert in that field or they're going to do something and you have expertise in the matter and you know they're making the wrong decision, you can cite your expertise, mention your specialization, and that's not considered boasting because you're not doing it with the intention of bragging. You're mentioning it because you want to give nasiha to the person, sincere counsel. And the sincere counsel is that you are uh, an expert and you're qualified in that matter and you know what you're talking about. And this is found in the Qur'an as well, because in Surah Yusuf, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Yusuf said, اِجْعَلْنِي عَلَىٰ خَزَائِنِ الْأَرْضِ إِنِّي حَفِيظٌ عَلِيمٌ He said, place me in charge of the treasure stores, the treasury, the agricultural output of the land. Verily, I am hafiz. I am protective and trustworthy, and I am alim, I am knowledgeable. He mentions his specialization, his expert knowledge, as well as his trust as the qualifiers for him taking that position. So even if it's a matter of you recommending yourself for a position because you know you are eminently qualified for it, that's not boasting because it is not done with the intention of bigging your ego up for self-aggrandizement or arrogance. So we go now to the next disease, which can be just a manifestation of the fakhr, the boasting that we are just now talking about. He says, and this is arrogance, he says, وَطَوْضُهَا الشَّامِخُ أَعْنِي الْكِبْرَى حَقِّرْهُ إِنْ أَرَدْتَ أَنْ يَخِرَّ You should deem its tall mountain 
as insignificant, by which I mean, of course, arrogance. Do this if you desire it to collapse to the ground. The word arrogance in Arabic is kibr, and from that we have the word kabir, large, big. We have the sense of self-aggrandizement, of bigging oneself up, of glorifying the self. This is the linguistic meaning. If you have arrogance like a towering mountain, you need to pulverize it and lower it. So kibir is linguistically coming from the same word as big or large or gargantuan. And it has a technical meaning as well in the science of spirituality. And that definition comes directly from the Prophet wasallam, Because he defined arrogance for us by saying that kibr is batrul haq wa ghamtul nas. It is to reject the truth and to look down on people and disdain them. The Prophet ﷺ said that no one who has an atom's weight of pride will enter Jannah. And when he said that, some of the Sahaba became very alarmed. And that is because they thought that prideful demeanor or looking nice and presentable is tantamount to arrogance. So one of them said, Ya Rasulullah, but a person likes to have a nice garment and have nice shoes and nice hair. And the Prophet wasallam addressed this and said, Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. Rather, arrogance is to reject truth and look down on people. In another narration, the Prophet wasallam said that the arrogant and the haughty people will on the day of judgment be transformed to the size of ants to be trampled on by everyone else. So kibir as in largeness, it can be a physical reality. It could also be a state where a person bigs themselves up and looks down on others. And that is, trans, that is transmuted on the day of judgment where the person is literally smaller by be, and being trampled on by other people. So kibr is a very major disease. It is the root of a lot of disbelief and rejection of truth, uh, if not all of it. And when you study the science of spirituality and look into the different diseases of the heart, you find that a lot of ink has been spilled talking about arrogance. Uh, we could spend days and days just on this disease alone. So in order to look at it in a very brief manner in the interest of time, we want to look at, number one, how does it manifest, what are its causes, and how do we treat it theoretically and practically. There are four things we need to look at. First is, how does kibr manifest? What does kibr look like in, in real time? The Prophet ﷺ says that it is to reject truth and to look down on people. And the scholars mentioned that the worst form of arrogance is arrogance towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the root of the disbelief of those who turn away from Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's arrogance, it's pride. Then comes the arrogance towards ulama and salihin and awliya, an arrogance towards scholars and pious righteous people and this is the arrogance that causes one to look down on them to deny their miracles and virtues to reject their advice that is grounded in the Quran and the Sunnah so this is really an extension of the first form of kibr so there's a kibr towards Allah Ta'ala there's a kibr towards the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then there's this kibr towards the inheritors of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he says in the hadith, Al-Ulama Warathatul Anbiya. The scholars are the heirs of the prophets. And the scholars here, we don't mean just the scholars of fiqh. We mean the scholars of spirituality, scholars of hadith, scholars of uh, theology, those who represent the tradition of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who are Alimuna Billah Ubi Ahkamillah. 
those who know Allah Ta'ala and know the rulings of Allah Ta'ala. Arrogance towards them is really an extension of arrogance towards the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then lastly comes the kibr towards the creation in general, towards people. And kibr, as is mentioned in the hadith, it gives rise to a rejection of truth, to it gives rise to disdain, to looking down on people, it causes people to refuse to accept sound advice. It causes people to be unfair in their judgments about other people because they're looking down on them. It causes them to follow their own desires, to ignore sound advice, and it causes them to deny the good of other people because they can't see it, because they're too busy bigging themselves up over other people. This is how kibber manifests in different ways. There is the the inner form of kibr, and then there is the outer form of kibr called takabbur, and there's overlap between these two. Uh, takabbur can be in the way we talk to people, it could be in the way we walk, it could be in the way we act, and these are all manifesting out external manifestations of the internal state of kibr within the heart. So a person can be outwardly humble. They can look humble, they can lower their head and walk very slowly and seem very subdued, but internally they can be full of arrogance if they're looking down on other people and rejecting truth or one or the other. A person can be externally arrogant in how they carry themselves, but it's for a legitimate reason and inwardly they're humble, as we see in the hadith of Abu Dujana that we mentioned some time ago where he was given the sword of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was walking يتبختر في المشي he was walking in a very vainglorious and arrogant way and this was to frighten the enemy scouts who were watching them from a distance walking in this way to which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says verily Allah hates this form of walking except for a person in this situation and this is why it's okay to manifest strength and honor and even in a way that looks arrogant when it is for the purpose of frightening those who need to be frightened to scare off enemies or potential threats. So, what causes kibr? What gives rise to kibr? There are a lot of different things that can cause a person to be arrogant. Imam al-Ghazali and others mention a number of things. Uh, they mention knowledge, for one, can be a cause of arrogance. We say that knowledge is power, and it, indeed it is, and it can be a cause of arrogance. Though, when we say that knowledge can be a cause of arrogance, we want to be careful and say that it's not the real edifying knowledge. It is the veneer of knowledge, because real knowledge is transformative. So a person can have knowledge, but if it's not transforming them, it's lacking. And that lacking form can cause a person to be arrogant. They learn something and they become arrogant. Whether it is a quote-unquote uh, worldly or secular subject or a religious subject, whether, whatever it may be. A person can learn medicine and become uh, a very skilled doctor and then look down on people and think that they are the best thing since sliced bread because, and they're God's gift to humanity because they're a doctor. A person can be a scholar of fiqh, of Islamic law, and look down on people as being ignorant of the sharia, and they disdain them and think they're, sim they're just simpletons. This is a form of arrogance. And this is a very dangerous form because knowledge is supposed to transform. It's supposed to make us humble. It's supposed to uh, acquaint us with our own limitations. وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Allah says that above every person of knowledge, there's someone more knowledgeable. So as we are growing in learning, whether it's in worldly sciences uh, or Islamic sciences, as we continue to learn, we should be more humble as we learn, the more we know, because the more we know and grow, the more we realize we don't know. So arrogance can, give, can come from this veneer of knowledge. Likewise, it could come from good works, from so-called good actions, righteous actions. 
And this is typically the, air, the, the arrogance of the holier-than-thou person. Uh, and we're not limiting this to Muslims. It's in every faith tradition. You have this archetype of the holy roly, of the holier-than-thou. This is the person who puts themselves forward as uber-religious, as super-pious. And it, they have an attitude of arrogance, of excessive seriousness. They look down on people and they're always judging them. And this is the person who thinks that everyone is cursed or destroyed or ruined because they're not as religious as they are. The Prophet Sallallahu spoke directly concerning these people when he says in the hadith, مَنْ قَالَ هَلَكَ النَّاسِ فَهُوَ أَهْلَكُهُمْ Whosoever says that the people are destroyed, then he is the most destroyed of them. Whoever says the people are ruined, he's the most ruined of them. So if a person is outwardly pious, they're praying, they're fasting, they're reading Qur'an, they're doing all these things, they have all the trappings of religious practice, but they look down on creation. They look down on their fellow Muslims and consider everyone doomed, everyone hell-bound, except for them and their small group. This person is the most ruined and destroyed of them all. Another form of arrogance or another thing that gives rise to arrogance can be lineage. A person comes from a good family. They come from a good stock. They come from a certain lineage uh, or ethnic group and they think that makes them superior to other people. Uh, this is essentially racism. This is certain forms of tribalism. And it's even possible that a person can be arrogant because of them being from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Now we honor the Ahlul Bayt. The Ahlul Bayt, the descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu have a position of honor. And out of reverence for Rasulullah Sallallahu we respect the family of the Prophet Sallallahu and his descendants for his sake, for the sake of their grandfather, out of respect and love and reverence towards him. And one of the things the scholars teach us is that it is to be a sharif, to be from the Ahlul Bayt. It is at once taklif and tashrif. It is both an honor and a very weighty responsibility because just as there's honor in being from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu there's also an increased responsibility. And you find that the very best among the Ahlul Bayt are those who are, number one, they don't go around telling everyone that any chance, any chance they get that they're from the Ahlul Bayt. People who do that tend to be fake because they get prestige and honor. So you get a lot of that in different parts of the world. You meet the person and within, you know, within a, a minute of meeting them, they got to tell you that they're from the Ahlul Bayt because they want something. They want to establish their position and privilege in society. A lot of times those people have fake lineages to begin with, though we have to be careful and not deny people's lineages uh, out the gate because as the hadith says, people are regarded as trustworthy in what they convey of their family lineage. Uh, so the, no the noblest of the Ahlul Bayt you find are those who don't go around per, uh, mentioning it all the time. And they are also the humblest of people. And they're people of service. So this is one way that uh, arrogance can arise through lineage. Others would be uh, wealth, strength, beauty, and so on. And we see all of these archetypes in the Quran. The people who are arrogant because of their lineage. People who are arrogant because of their wealth. We see in Surah Al-Kahf, the man, the two men in the garden, people who are arrogant because of their strength. Ad and Thamud were destroyed. They were destroyed, though they were boasting and bragging about their strength. People who brag about their good works. People who are arrogant because of their so-called righteousness. We see these archetypes throughout the Quran. All of these things can give rise to arrogance. Now, what is the root cause of arrogance? Why is it that people feel that these things 
make them better than other people. Imam al-Ghazali says that these things come from conceit or arrogance can come, can come because of envy. As you envy someone, when you're jealous of them, you may behave in an arrogant way towards them. Sometimes it comes from hatred and rancor. And we see all of these qualities are combined in the person of Iblis, alayhi la'natullah, shaitan himself. He was filled with rancor, with conceit, with envy, with showing off. And all of these things gave rise to his, ang- his arrogance, which was the cause of him refusing to prostrate to Adam when Allah Ta'ala told him to prostrate to Adam. So, one of the things we have to be very, very aware of and very careful of is to never assume when hearing these descriptions that we are free of arrogance. If a person learns about arrogance and hears about these qualities and the different manifestations and thinks to himself or herself, I don't have these qualities, that is an indication that they may have the quality of arrogance. Because the truly humble person isn't witnessing their own humility. The truly humble person doesn't go around thinking, I'm so humble. But we know we have the culture where a person says, in my humble opinion, in my humble opinion, we recognize our own humility. Uh, So we don't want to be like that, where we think to ourselves, oh, I'm so humble, I'm so humble. Because then uh, we're bragging about being humble. We're bragging and boasting and proud of our humility, which is the antithesis of humility. So we have to be careful here. So let us all suppose out the gate that we have traces of arrogance. Maybe it doesn't manifest in an outward fashion. Maybe it's so subtle that we don't notice it most of the time. Let's assume and see what the treatment is for arrogance. And as long as we're applying the treatment continuously through our life, constantly renewing our repentance, and never making claims of being humble, we will in that way be humble. Just like the person who strives for sincerity doesn't witness their sincerity and say, I'm sincere. Likewise, the humble person strives to be humble without saying, I am humble. So the treatment for, for arrogance, Imam Muhammad Mawlud says, بِعِلْمِ رَبِّكَ وَنَفْسِكَ فَمَنْ عَرَفَ ذَيْنِ يَتَوَاضَعُ وَيَهِنْ مَقَامَهُ يَنْفِي مَقَامَ شُكْرِ كَمَا تَوَاضُعُ لَهُ ذُو جَرِّ وَذُلُّ وَضَاعَتُ وَذُلَّ وَضَاعَتَ جَنِّبِ وَحْذَرِ وَكْبُرْ عَلَى الْغَنِيِّ وَالْمُسْتَكْبِرِ He mentions the treatment here. Do that, treat arrogance, by knowing your Lord and knowing yourself. For whoever knows these two is humbled and feels insignificant. The station of arrogance negates the station of gratitude, just as humility by its nature engenders gratitude. Avoid and beware of humiliation and lowliness. In fact, display pride with the affluent and arrogant one. The treatment for, er- for arrogance is theoretical and practical. There's two dimensions to the treatment. The theoretical treatment is knowledge of our own origins, to know ourself and to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's the famous narration often mistakenly attributed to the Prophet sallallahu as a hadith, مَنْ عَرَفَ نَفْسَهُ فَقَدْ عَرَفَ رَبَّهُ He who knows himself knows his Lord. But it's true in meaning. If we know ourself in our origin and the lowly origin of human beings and how weak and needy we are, we will treat our arrogance and become more humbled. If we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will become more humbled. مِنْ أَيِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ خَلَقَهُ فَقَدَّرَ From what have we created man? From a nutfa. A, a small sperm drop after which we were apportioned. هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ حِينٌ مِنَ الدَّهْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْئًا مَذْكُورًا Has there not come upon man a time when 
He was nothing to be mentioned at all. لم يكن شيئا مذكورا This, our origin is Adam. It is absolute non-being, non-existence. And Allah Ta'ala is constantly recreating us at every moment because, this is a complex theological discussion, but our existence is not a permanent existence. It's not an existence like a wind-up clock acting autonomously. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala does not intervene in creation where it acts on its own and He intervenes. Our creation is constantly upheld and renewed at every moment, which means that non-existence is our origin, ultimately, because we come from nothing, literally. And this is the upper tier, higher order theoretical treatment for arrogance. Now, if arrogance manifests in those different ways we talked about, we can look at those specific cases and look at theoretical treatments. So if a person is arrogant because of their lineage, then they learn about how ignorant that is to be arrogant and proud over something they had no choice in. If they're arrogant about their beauty, they have to realize that they had no choice in their form, that Allah Ta'ala is the one who created them, and to realize that their beauty is illusory and always fading away. If it's because of strength, they should contemplate injuries, debilitating injuries, and how dependent they are on their body functioning in even the smallest of, of, of ways. Lower back pain, come on. <laughs> if anyone's ever had lower back pain, they recognize how helpless they are. How difficult it is to do almost anything in life if you have lower back pain. Even getting up off the couch and opening the front door is incredibly difficult if a person is suffering lower back pain, much less praying, much less getting in a car and driving and going to work and functioning. So thinking about those things will make us more humble. Uh, likewise, if a person is arrogant because of knowledge, they have to remember that knowledge is a proof against them. It's not a proof for them if it doesn't humble them, if it's not something that they're acting upon. And that people who don't have knowledge may be excused. But if a person has knowledge, they don't have an excuse. And these are just a theoretical ways of treating arrogance. When it concerns the practical treatment, we look at our sins. We look at our weaknesses. We take a very critical assessment of how we fall short. This is very important. And we recognize that we don't know what our final end is going to be. The wheel is constantly turning. We don't know what state we're going to be in when we die. And arrogance, according to the ulama, is one of the things that lead to su'al khatima عند الموت, an evil end at the time of death. Um, practically speaking, to pretend to be humble until humble becomes an actual trait. Fake it till you make it. Uh, and this is based on the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, where he said, uh, cry or weep. And if you cannot weep, فتباكو, then make yourselves weep. From this hadith, we get the principle that if you don't have a quality and you want it, you act as if you already do. You emulate those who have it and you force it. And then it becomes an actual quality. And most importantly, emulating the humble example of Sayyidul Mutawadirin, the master of those who were humble, Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who as a world leader would walk barefoot, would milk goats, would sew his own garments, who would walk the marketplaces with young children, who would, would do all of these things as a world leader, the humblest of Allah's creation, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And to the end of this uh, section where he talks about arrogance, he mentions something really interesting. I want to go back to this. He mentions uh, avoid and beware of humiliation and lowliness. In fact, display pride with the affluent and arrogant one. If someone reads this on a very surface level, they might think it's a contradiction. How is it Imam Muhammad Mulud is telling us to be humble and to avoid being arrogant? Yet here he's saying, avoid and beware of humiliation and lowliness. Shouldn't we be lowly? 
Is it so that the opposite of arrogance is lowliness? The answer to that is no. And Imam Muhammad Maulud is very careful at the end to tell us that being a humble person, like the other virtues we've been speaking about, is about maintaining a balance and about recognizing this dichotomy. This quality of humility requires balance. Humility is not defined as self-humiliation. Da'a and dhul. We have uh, a state of lowliness before our Lord, but we are not asked to be lowly and humiliated and to have this abject humiliation toward other people or when behaving with other people. So the, there's a dichotomy here. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, لا ينبغي للمؤمن أن يذل نفسه It's not appropriate for a believer, it is not fitting for a believer to humiliate himself. We have humili humiliation and lowliness before our Lord, but we do not have that before the creation, especially when it is abject humiliation. He mentions here that you should in fact behave in a prideful way when you are around the affluent and the arrogant people. This is very interesting because humility is the careful balance between arrogance on one side and abject humiliation on the other. Humility is not abject humiliation. It's in between abject humiliation and arrogance. Pride is for a person to elevate themselves above their level and abject humiliation is to lower themselves beneath their level to the point where they neglect their rights and allow others to neglect their rights. They become a doormat, essentially. If a person is, he is saying that if you are around someone who is wealthy and arrogant, you should not behave in a humble manner because if you behave in a humble manner towards the arrogant, you increase them in their arrogance. If you've ever been around a person who's really proud of themselves, they're really arrogant. If you behave in a submissive and meek manner, you empower them. You uh, encourage them to continue behaving in an arrogant way. But if you behave with dignity, with politeness, but with dignity and self-honor, you're not helping them increase in arrogance. And also by treating them in that way, you are pushing back against that attitude and hopefully they wake up and stop being arrogant. Uh, there's a narration from Imam al-Zuhri, one of the early Imams. He said that one of the strongest handholds of Iman is to behave with prideful dignity in the face of an arrogant person of dunya. This is a sign of humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you act in this way towards an arrogant person. Because if a person did not have humility before Allah ta'ala, they would be humbled and awed before wealthy and powerful people. We see it all the time. The way people treat wealthy and arrogant people. They want to ingratiate themselves to them and they act in this submissive way. But a person who has izzah to nafs, they're not arrogant in a blameworthy sense. But when they're around people who are arrogant, they show a little extra izzah. And this is what we have to, to have. So again, there's always this dichotomy that we have to be aware of, inward and outward. And in this case, the difference between arrogance as a disease of the heart and abject humiliation, which is also another disease of the heart. And if a person finds themselves gravitating to one or the other, they have to take active steps to bring themselves into balance. And that's going to look different for different people. And so texts like these give us a very broad description and we have to see where are we in this description. And if we are here, this is how we treat it. If we're over there, this is how we treat it. We ask Allah Ta'ala to remove arrogance from our heart and to make us from the mutawadi'een, the people of, humili of humility, of tawadu', of softness and character, but who have izzatun nafs, who have dignity and forbearing behavior. Ameen. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.
wa sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh